right, good morning everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, so let's quickly recap what we covered yesterday. So essentially I introduced the ring of symmetric functions first in just n variables. Okay, and this was just the polynomials in n variables that are symmetric under the action of the symmetric group. And then we had seen that this was a graded ring where we just do the grading by the degree. Okay, that's the total degree of the, of the polynomials. And then slightly more sort of complicated, we looked at this ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables. And the way we constructed that was using this inverse system. I haven't written that up again, but the point was that we essentially arrived at this using an inverse limit, but sort of in the category of graded rings, okay? So which is very important to avoid getting objects that have unbounded degree, okay? We'll actually see some of those objects today, so it's not that they are bad, but they're not part of the traditional ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables, okay? And sort of an important remark was that if you look at the kth graded piece of this ring of infinite sym of, of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables, then as a sort of Z module, this is just isomorphic to working in N variables, but you have to make sure that N is large enough relative to the degree, okay? So in particular, what this means is if you want to prove something in the ring of symmetric functions in infinitely many variables, then it's really enough to just work with a finite number of variables. Or, okay, so as long as that finite number is, is big enough. So if you have a particular identity, for example, for between symmetric functions, then, and that identity is between functions of, say, degree k, if you prove this on n variables where n is at least k, then you have proven this in infinitely many variables at the same time. Okay, so that's, that's very convenient. And then we looked at, well, up to now at two bases. First one was just the basis of monomial symmetric functions. So that was sort of obviously a basis because all we're doing is symmetrizing a, a single monomial, turning it into something that is symmetric. And then we also looked at the elementary symmetric functions. And again, we saw that they were a basis of the ring of symmetric functions, okay? And here I've written down sort of the first few examples of these things in the ring of symmetric functions. And, and I should really stress that this is, of course, a misnomer because a symmetric function is not a function. And Jules asked me the questions last night, where does the terminology come from? And I don't really know. They sort of, it is to distinguish it from actual polynomials because something that has infinitely many variables is not considered a polynomial, so they call it a function. But the point is, of course, it's also not a function and they should have chosen something else, but somehow this is what's stuck and, and, and we have to live with that, okay? But it's, so they are not polynomials and not functions, but that's uh, what we call them. All right, and finally, sort of I want to remind you that we computed the generating function for these elementary symmetric functions, and we'll see that a lot more later today. So, and it has a very simple product form. Essentially, if a variable occurs, it sort of, it sits here if it doesn't occur, because you can never have xi squared in an elementary symmetric function. So that's why you get this type of generating function. All right. So I should probably, before I continue, ask if there were any remaining questions about what we did yesterday? And if not, then we'll continue on. So everyone good to go and all right. So what I'm going to do today is, well, first of all, introduce a bunch more bases, but not, let, not yet the sure bases. I think that's going to be for the last two lectures. And after I've given you a, a few more bases, complete symmetric function and power sums, I'm going to talk about something that perhaps you don't find in McDonald, and that's really the use of lambda ring or platistic notation, which is a very useful tool that sort of most practitioners these days use a lot. And, and I'll touch upon how this also relates to the structure of the ring of symmetric functions as a, as a Hopf algebra, okay? And, and I think one of your exercises for this 
well, later this morning is, is about that. Okay? So that's sort of where we're going. So the first one, so as I said, we need a few more bases, especially if I want to talk about this platistic stuff. And most importantly for that is going to be the power sums. But I'm first going to define the complete symmetric functions. HR, and so, well, how are they defined? So HR, well, we have the monomials. So if I simply sum over all monomial symmetric functions where partitions are of size R, then that's the definition of a complete symmetric function. Now, that's not very explicit, but it turns out that you can, just like the elementary symmetric function, write this down very explicitly. But whereas in the elementary symmetric functions, a variable could never be squared or have higher power, that's no longer the case. We get something like this, i1, xi2. So we have a bunch of monomials. So you can see this is obviously a function of degree r. Of course, you also see that's from, from, from this particular expression. But now, a particular variable, let's say x6, can occur arbitrarily many times because you can have many of these ij's to be equal, OK? And so again, we can compute the generating function. HR, but instead of, I mean, here it's only because we can get them either each variable can occur only, well, not or at most once. Now it can occur arbitrarily often, so we really get the geometric series for each of the variables. So we immediately see that this is going to give us 1 minus Z to the XR, OK? So just expand each of these terms in a geometric series. And you'll see if you stick that in. I mean, I'm not going to do that little calculation. It's sort of obvious. And this is going to be very important definition for us. I'm going to write this as sigma z, or if you wish. Sometimes I will write down the variables. Sometimes I won't. Okay, I've deliberately not given a name to the de generating function for elementary symmetric functions because I like to see them as actually the same as complete symmetric functions. So I don't want two notation. Okay, so we'll we'll get to that later. Okay, so these are the complete symmetric functions. All right. So in particular, if you look at this. These two generating functions, you can already see there's a bit of a relation. So now it's perhaps inconvenient that I haven't given that a name. But all right, I'll just for a little while, I'll pay the price for that. So if I take, again, let's just for clarity add the variables. If I take this thing here and I multiply it with the generating function for the elementaries, But I replace z by the negative of z. So in other words, I pick up a minus here, right? And so if I multiply these two things, you see you have what exactly the same stuff in the numerator as the denominator. So this is just going to give you 1. OK? That's hopefully clear. So if you extract coefficients of z, okay, so just extract z to the power whatever of this product of generating functions, you'll find something like this.
Okay? So unless n is actually 0, then I have a 1 on the right hand side. For any higher power of z, I should get a 0 if I extract the coefficient. So this is just a Kronecker delta here. And you get this relation between the E and the H. And we'll see later. Um, well, so we will reinterpret. this uh, in terms of, of, well, let's say cladistic. And I haven't yet told you what that is. Well, notation later. OK, so just remember it for now that these, these two functions apparently are, are closely related. OK, they're really two sides of the same coin. All right, that's the complete symmetric functions. Well, a little bit more on the actual relationship between the two. So now I'm going to define uh, involution on the ring of symmetric functions. So map lambda to itself, and how is this defined? Well, if I take an elementary, I just replace it by a complete symmetric function. Okay, that's the that's the definition. Okay, so it follows immediately from this that this is actually an involution. Okay, so let's just write this as claim is an involution. And how does it follow? Well, you just stick it in this, right? So because, well, to see how this works, we have k from 0 up to n minus 1 to the power k. And then we get, well, if I apply, so let's write here, apply omega 2, let me call this star, OK? Then, of course, I get this E becomes an H by my definition. So this is H of K now. And here I've got omega of H and minus K. And that's, of course, still that same delta function or Kronika delta. I replace K by N minus K. And you see that it just takes exactly that form again. Anyway, these are just trivial manipulations. I'm probably boring you with that. So here I would get h and minus k. And over here I still have this involution now acting on h of k. I mean, note if I change k to n minus k, I pick up a minus 1 to the power n here. But if I bring that to the other side because of the delta function, I can just drop it. So I haven't dropped any minus signs here at all. So that just tells me that this must be e of k. OK? So note that if I had worked with only n variables rather than in the ring of symmetric functions of infinitely many variables, this would not have been an involution, OK? Because the ER, if R is greater than n, would give you 0, whereas the ages for any R, they are non-zero even in lambda n. So you have to be careful here. So not everything that works in lambda still works when you work with finitely many variables, OK? So just something to, to keep in mind. All right. So what does this tell us? Well, it immediately tells us, of course, because the E's are Z bases. And well, we just apply this involution. And so we find that the H's are Z bases as well. OK, so I think this recap here can go. And we 
you can immediately, so. Right, that. Okay, so these are yet another basis for our ring of symmetric functions. And also, of course, if I work with only finitely many variables, I only need the first n. But unlike, I mean, this is to come back to my earlier remark, unlike the elementaries, which simply, if the index becomes too large, they just, they vanish. It's not true for the ages, so, so note that h of r for, or maybe to make it clear, note, so if I work in the ring of symmetric functions in n variables, then in, so in that ring, h r for r greater than n is not zero, okay? So the point is, given that this is a basis, they're no longer algebraically independent, okay? So, you, as I said, you have to be careful with that, all right? Um, so, for example, I think, for example, in, so, I would get something like, I think, H3, and I'm making this up here. You can check this at home. Uh, maybe. Well, I think I wrote it down. It's not important. It's not, of course, relevant. 2H1 minus H1 cubed. Right? As I said, it's completely unimportant what that relation exactly is. It's just making the point that they no longer, if you can consider the entire set of complete symmetric functions, they're no longer algebraically independent, okay? All right. The most important basis for today, certainly when I want to talk about um, well, the ring of symmetric functions as a lambda ring is are really the power sums, okay? So the power sum, it's yet another basis. Turns out it's not actually Z basis, but a Q basis of the ring of symmetric functions, but it's, it's very convenient to work with it, okay? So that's the sort of last basis we need today. So the, again, a lot of this early stuff goes back to Newton, although we usually don't actually just call it the power sums. P of R, where I take R to be, I drop the zero, though later I'll just define P zero to be one, but so, so hardly defined. It's just the monomial symmetric function indexed by partition that consists of only a single row. Okay, and again, that's not very explicit. Uh, well, yeah. Okay, so it's just all of the rth powers of each of the individual variables, you add them up, and, and that's what it is. Okay? All right, so, well, that's just the definition. Okay, so let's again look at the generating function, and I'm going to define this at psi of z, and again, a little warning here that if you read McDonald's book, I'm going to use a different definition for this psi, because of course, I was sort of a, 
well, like Jennifer, we were students of Alain Lascaux. And of course, when the very first time I wrote down a generating function the way it was in McDonald's, he started yelling at me. So I never did that again. I said, that's the wrong definition. And he was always very convinced that he was right. And he was almost always right. So I'm not having a go at McDonald because he's pretty amazing too, but somehow, anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to be good here, just in case Alain is listening. Okay, so, uh, whoops, z to the power r, okay, tr, but I'm going to stick in a one on r here in the denominator. Okay, so as I said, this is not, well, I don't know if this is standard. It's, I now also believe this is more convenient, so, and we, we'll see. Uh, all right, maybe I'll leave this up, because I'm soon going to relate this to the generating function for the complete symmetric functions. <laughs> Okay, so well, the question is, can we compute this? Well, so of course, let's just try. So r greater or equal to one, zr p to the r, sorry, p r, not p to the r, of course, divided by r. I just stick in the definition So I'll get another sum, and now I get z xi to the power r divided by r, okay? So now I first carry out the sum over r, and of course we all remember what that is, I hope. Here's another piece of chalk. That's the log. That's why this is such a great definition. And if you don't have the one on R, you don't get that. Okay. So, well, so in other words, this is the log. I just bring this inside and this minus sign. This is so this becomes a product of, and you see you get exactly this. Okay, so we get the log of sigma, the generating function of the complete symmetric functions. Okay, so in other words, and Okay, we get this nice relation between these two generating functions, which is really, really cool. Well, maybe it's not yet clear to you why this is cool, but it turns out that these power sums, and as I said, I'm later going to use this to define platistic notation, they sort of have additive structure, whereas these completes, or at least the generating function, they have multiplicative structure. And if you sort of ever wondered, well, why is that the case? Well, if you see something like this, of course, it's immediately obvious because you get one from the other by either taking a log or exponentiating, depending on which one you, you start with, okay? And, and so that's, that's, as I said, a very useful relation. And again, to go back to Mr. Newton, There's something known as the Newton relations. And so, I can say this implies it's really sort of, I always find it quite nice that some of these elementary 
function stuff goes back to Newton. Well, you could either say, well, we haven't learned much since, because he already understood all of this. But at the same time, well, if he cared about it, then maybe we should care about it too, right? That's, so I, I take the positive point of view rather than the, the negative one. Okay, so over here, I want to get something like, I want to not have the, yeah, so I want n minus r here. Okay, and then over here, I want the minus one to the power r. I think I do this right. I mean, I'm gonna prove this in a sec, but let's at least try to prove the correct thing. Um, have I got the night? Yes, and the pr, of course, over here. So I think that's, that's right, okay? So let's, as I said, we'll just prove it and then we see if I've got that right. So I never remember these because it really immediately follows from, from this relation, of course. So that's, that's easy to remember. This is not easy to remember, okay? So what you do is you multiply by something like z to the power n, or maybe I take an n minus one, whatever is more convenient. I think I take an n minus one and then you sum over n, okay, greater or equal to one. Okay, so let's see, what do I get? I get n times h, n times z, n to the power minus one. What is that? Maybe you can tell me. What's the left hand side? because I do too much talking. What's the left-hand side? Sorry? Yes. Okay, I think the, it's still up there. If I take the derivative with respect to z, I get r times h r z to the power r minus one, and then I might as well start summing from one because the zero term disappears. So I get this, everyone happy with that? All right, so on the right hand side, I now of course get a double sum, and I of course always interchange the order of the sum. So R, I just sum this from greater or equal to zero, and then N must be summed greater than R, but we're all smart people here, so let me already change N to N plus R. So this just becomes a zero, okay? So that's a minus one to the power r. I had a pr over here. I had an h, n minus r, but I had already changed n to n plus r, so that's just an hn. And I had a z to the power n minus one, so that's a z, but I changed n to n plus r, okay? Well, so if I take the sum over r, what is, well, let's first do the sum over h, perhaps. h n z to the power n, so I certainly see sigma of z again, okay? That takes care of this bit, this bit, and that. And, well, what do we see over here? What do we see there? Again, I need some, I need some help. But I think I probably, so now I see, because I don't want a minus sign here, so I was lying to you, so we've now reconstructed this, and now I can really ask you what I see. P R Z to the power R minus, so again, it's not quite this, but if I differentiate with respect to Z again, and I bring an r down, cancels that one, and it gets z to the power r minus one. So as I said, I can never remember these formulas, so I did it all wrong initially, but that's of course just this here. Okay, well indeed, if I differentiate this with respect to z, right, I get psi comes down, psi derivative, and then I get, again, sigma z. So that's just the, okay? 
Okay, that just follows from, so let me, okay, so that just follows from, well, so as I said, we had this, and all you do is just you differentiate the left and the right, and that's the same equation that we just had, okay? So in any case, that's, that's Newton, okay? All right, so what you see also from this Newton relation, so in that sense they are important. So, so from, well, from Newton, because essentially you can solve by the H's for the P's, okay, given, and also the P's, of course, in terms of the H's, but that's less interesting, given that the H's are an algebraic basis, so it follows that. But unfortunately, because you see that n there, so if you solve, you actually, you can't solve this over the integers. So I need to work, rather than over z, I need to work over q, but that's no big deal. And then, power sums are yet another, another basis, okay? Um, okay, so, so but let me know that H2, for example, if I try to solve this in terms of the P's, you get this, so it's definitely not a Z basis, okay? Because I can't express H2 in terms of, okay, so, so not a Z basis. Okay? All right. I think that's, we, well, we need one final little thing so that the, one of the exercises you did yesterday makes more sense. Um, and then we are going to talk about statistic notation. So I think this can probably go here. <laughs> can remember the power sums. Okay, so what I'm going to do is now express the power sums. I'm going to relate them to the monomial or to the uh, complete symmetric function. So we already, of course, see a little bit of that over here. That's just h indexed by a single, well, just by an integer. Um, but I'm now going to define p of lambda to be just the power sum indexed by partition. And I do this the same way as we did this for the elementaries and so on. It's just a product of the parts of the uh, individual power sums. And I'm going to look at the generating function for that. So let, okay, so P lambda is just product I greater or equal to one, P lambda I, but I'd never defined for you what P zero was, so, so after, of course, your partition only has finitely many positive contributions, and after that we get an infinite string of zeros, but they're not going to contribute because I just set all of those equal to one, okay? So then we have sigma z, so I 
percentage of what is z lambda? Well, you've computed that, or at least some of you, I hope. Did everyone look at that second question? Okay. So where z lambda? So remember, these were the multiplicities of each part in your partition. And here they are again. And so we've all learned yesterday that this is nothing but right if you compute the centralizer of an element in the symmetric group that, well, an element that has that is indexed by a partition of cycle type exactly given by these multiplicities. Okay, so if you compute the size of that centralizer, that was precisely this thing. Because that Centralizer, or at least the, the size of it, occurs a lot in these formulas from symmetric functions. If you wonder, well, where does it come from, right? Rather than just some random number that I introduced, well, it has a group theoretic interpretation, okay? Even though it's not really going to play much of a role, but it will certainly make this easier to understand where it comes from, okay? Of course, if I, okay, so let, let's do this as a, so then we have this, of course, by or to again extract powers or by extracting the coefficient z to the power r, this simply tells me that hr is lambda partition of r d lambda, okay, and so if you do this for, for example, for H2, then hopefully you can check that I did not tell you any lies and that this is what you get, okay? Anyway, okay? So let's, maybe try to prove this, well, we have, well, let me start maybe with the right-hand side. Um, lambda, let's see what I want to do, p lambda, Z lambda divided. Yeah, it's a bit of a pain that there's this Z, this is the Z that's just a formal variable in my generating function, and the other is just my Z lambda. Um, but that's just how it's okay. Maybe it's maybe it's actually easier, or maybe it's more instructive to actually start with the other end. So I can use this nice exponential. So let's, it doesn't really matter at what end you you start, of course, but maybe it's cooler to do this. Okay, so let's actually do that. So let's do sigma z, so that's my left hand side, but I now can replace this by this nice exponential relation by the, right, just the e to the power of the generating function of the power sums. But what is that generating function? So of course you have to remember the definition, power sum, z to the power r, and then so that Alain is not yelling at you, you divide by r. Okay, so that's e, r greater equal to one. To stick in the definition, sum of all of the variables to the power r, but I also have a z here to the power r divided by r. Okay. So I probably I'm going to put this i here, okay? Because that's going to be the same as that product thing over there. And then I'm going to 
each of these um, exponentials. Well, let me also, for now, maybe. I mean, what I want to do is essentially expand this. Uh, OK, so let's, I think I probably want to do something like this. And then expand the exponential function. OK, so e to the power. So essentially, I want to ex expand all of this. And so I get, let me write this as mi greater equal to 0, um, xiz. OK, this is a z to the power. Did I do this correctly? Yes, we have an r. And now we also have an mi. mi factorial. And essentially what I'm going to do here is simply reinterpret those m's. So these are just mi's. They don't mean anything yet. But of course, I'm going to introduce a partition lambda. And I'm going to write it like this. Right, this mi, this first mi, the m1 is just the multiplicity of the parts 1, 2 is going to be the multiplicity of the parts 2, and so on. Okay, so this actually becomes that particular uh, interpretation. Um, and I think I'm, let's see, have I, okay, I'm, I've done a little bit too much, I think. I didn't really need any of the variables. I could just stick to the PRs themselves so I can get rid of, so otherwise I'll just have to later stick in the definition again. So I don't really need, I can just keep the, I had a PR here. It's maybe more efficient. So let's just do it like this, okay. So rather than actual variables, because if I sum all of those, I again just get the PR again. So I might as well just stick to that. So we had PR over here and Z to the power R. So that's better. OK? And so maybe I'll call, well, let me call this M. I can now call this R. Well, OK, let's stick to R. I could write it as R here. So I have to be careful that my labeling is consistent. OK? So now each. Because all of these MRs are sum over infinitely many of them, but each, each set of MRs is just corresponds to a partition. So that's the same as summing over a partition. And we get a product of all these PRs. But a product of PRs, that's just, well, right? P1 occurs with the multiplicity M1, P2 with the multiplicity M2, so that's precisely P lambda. I get z1 to the power, well, I get, so also note that the size of that partition, that is exactly the number of ones plus two times the number of twos, OK? So you see here, you can't read it because I've been sloppy here. OK, you see that same thing, r times. So of course, that's the same as r greater or equal to 1 r times mr. So that precisely gives me z to the size of the partition. And let's see. I've dropped this r here in my expansion. That should still have been there. OK. And now. I've precisely seen the denominator, the product of all of the MR factorials and R. So because I did a power series expansion of that, that should also have been in MR. So I dropped that term. I apologize. But of course, now you see precisely what I get in the denominator. So that wasn't my best effort here. <laughs> but in any case, hopefully you get the you get the idea. 
So you see again, essentially this relation follows as a direct consequence if you were more competent than I am from this relation between the generating functions. And obviously, if you have a relation between the generating functions and you're smart enough that you can compute without mistakes, that of course gives you an identity between the actual fun individual functions, okay? That's, that is all you really need to remember and, um, okay. All right, so now we have all of these bases. Let's now completely change our point of view. Because I want to, so, well, okay, so maybe whether this is topic number three, let's call it platistic or or lambda ring notation. Okay, now I hope Alain is not listening because he didn't like the word platistic and he always used lambda ring, but given that no one else does, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take the liberty here to, to, to mostly use the word platistic rather than lambda rings, but in any case. Okay, so, all right, so what's this about? Okay, so, well, so I'm first I'm going to just give you a statement that won't mean much. Uh, okay, so that this is just, as I said, this is just jargon, and then I hopefully I can explain to you what I'm what I'm on about. So maybe viewed as a free lambda ring in one variable. Okay, well that's not very helpful unless you know what lambda rings are, okay? Maybe you can make sense of the word free, that's what we have had before, it just means that right, things have a basis, but anyway. So I'm not going to formally define for you what a lambda ring is, but I'm going to essentially describe for you how what this really, what these words, what they actually imply for us, okay? So, so we will not formally define what this means. Just no time, and we don't really need it. I mean, I'm, it's all, I'm, I'm still everything I'm going to do ma will make sense and is in some sense rigorous, so we'll just not use exactly that language. Uh, but sort of, so we'll not formally define what this means, but well, maybe to make this a proper sentence, we will explore its consequences. Because it is very useful to be aware of this and to make use of the full power of this notion, okay? So let's see how we can just do this purely at the level of symmetric functions without, as I said, formalizing this in terms of lambda rings, okay? So, well, so first of all, so note that we may view symmetric functions as, well, let me just align like that, acting on, really on sets, right? We've written x1, x2, dot, 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 but really given that the functions are by definition symmetric, order is not part of the picture, right? So 
i.e., you should really write something like this. Well, let me just write it like that, where Okay, simply, so y, well, right, order does not matter. Okay, we, we have symmetry. So, okay, so I haven't said anything particularly profound yet, right? Okay, so, but instead, so, so we will adopt additive notation for sets. And I already made the remark earlier, there's some additive versus multiplicative stuff going on when we had this relation, it's maybe no longer on the board. Well, we have the derivative of that relation on the board. Okay, and we're going to build that sort of into what we're going to do. Okay, so I'm going to write x, which you can still think of as just your traditional set, but I'm going to write this as I'll just write it like that. Okay, just notation, so I can do whatever I like with notation. Okay, as long as it's clear that a plus now, it just, right, it's just not a way of writing a set that perhaps you're not so used to, but okay, you're still all very young and, and flexible in mind, so let's just forget about that bad notation. This is much better, okay? Let's accept that for a moment. Now, so to sort of, so to make clear, we use additive notation okay, we write If we, so, okay, right, this was just f on our set, but actually, so, and as before, if I want write, to write out just a variable, so there's nothing additive about this, but now I have additive notation, and if I use the additive notation, so it's clear that what I'm doing is additive, I use these square brackets, And also, if I don't want to write out what my, alpha, what my set is, I'll just write it like this, okay? Still just notation. And these are called statistic brackets. And just to tell the reader, I'm, well, assuming you're reading a paper, I'm using this additive notation, okay? Just a warning. So I can do that, all right. And so in general, we call, if I adopt this particular convention, I said we have sets, but I don't like the word set very much. So I'll just say it's a symmetric function acts on an alphabet, okay? Again, it's just an equivalent word, right? So I'm no longer going to talk about sets, I'm going to talk about alphabets. But if you don't like that, you just substitute this for set. But people in algebraic combinatorics, I don't know why we don't like sets very much, but we like alphabets a lot. So that's just the language we use. OK. OK? So that's just, just a set, at least for now. Because, of course, I'm going to introduce more complicated alphabets that you can't write down as an explicit set. OK? So, it's not really a one-to-one, -one, but at this point, it is a one-to-one -one relation, all right?
Okay. So we now want want to consider more complicated alphabets. Okay? Why just stick to something? Because so far I haven't gained anything. All I've done is change my notation. And if, if this is all there is to it, there would be no point, right? But of course there is a point. Okay, so let's, well, I'm going to define, because I have additive notation, what I mean by this. Okay, well, and you should really think of this, well, let's just set union, but you have to be careful. If your x and your y are really just your traditional sets, and so far that's all we've got, then this is literally set union, okay? But as I said later, I'm going to construct more complicated alphabets that you can't write as a set, and I'll still use the notion of x plus y to sort of say take the union of these alphabets, okay? But they won't, will no longer be sets. So that's, that's sort of the subtle difference. So how am I going to define this? Well, I'm going to define how this works on the power sums. Simply, the power sum of x plus the power sum of y. Okay? That's not very deep. Okay? So note, if so let's say x is really just a traditional set, so I can really write it in my additive notation like this, okay? That's the same as doing this, but now in an index-free manner, but it's still an actual set. And if, if y is like that as well, and again, so far we have got, the, we don't have anything else, well, then we can, then this is, this is consistent with what we had, okay? Because then we knew that if I compute PR of X plus Y, then it was literally just the sum of all of the letters in my first set, or alphabet. So then, then I can write, and maybe I'm running out of space here, so let me continue over here. Okay, so then well we knew that in that particular case, of course the R power sum was just, as I said, you take all of your letters in your alphabet, this is just a normal set union, so it would indeed be just this. which is, of course, indeed okay, but as I said later, we'll consider more complicated alphabets where we'll still use that rule for how you add them, but that alphabet may no longer be set, okay? So again, I've said this many times, but it is important. Here we get the very first example now of something that perhaps you can't write actually as a set. Well, no, let's first also note so for example, if I take an alphabet and I add it to itself n times, well, I just keep repeating that rule and you just get n times 
okay? So this is literally, you take the power sum, but every, so x1, for example, is repeated n times, then x2 is repeated n times, x3 is repeated n times, and so on, and we get something like this, okay? I want you to note this because we're going to consider that later when our notation becomes slightly troublesome, and so I have to really give you this with warts and all. And anyway, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So now, second thing I want to, okay, I'm going to define for you what x minus y is. That's already at the level of, imagine that x and y themselves were just ordinary sets. Right, like x1, x2, dot, 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 and then y1. I mean, now we are taking the one set minus another set. Is that still a set? Not so clear, but as an alphabet, it's fine. Because I'll just tell you how I compute with that. This is known as a statistic minus sign. And this is, of course, an ordinary minus sign. Okay. We'll get to that. As I said, there are, I said, I give you this with warts and all, which is one of the reasons you won't find this in McDonald's book. He didn't like this. But you give up so much by not liking this that it's now just universally accepted this is the best way to work with symmetric functions. But yes, there are some notational complications that we can overcome. And, and of course, you've pointed at one of them. All right, so this is a platistic minus sign. This is not an ordinary minus sign, as Leo just reminded us. So what do we do with an ordinary minus sign? Well, we'll get to that later, okay? All right, so note, so for example, this is certainly, if I take x, let's say plus y, and you do it like that, Well, according to my rules, right, first alphabet is x plus y. I subtract another alphabet. But now my rule is this is PR of x plus PR of y minus PR of y. So these things cancel, and this is just PR of x. That shows that this is also the same as PR of x plus y minus y, and so on. So inside these statistic brackets, I can just work as if these are normal variables or elements in some commutative ring, OK? And that's what's going to be the power of these things, that you can just manipulate these alphabets. And you can forget about the fact that you're dealing with alphabets, that minus signs are platistic minus signs, and that pluses, if you wish, are platistic pluses. All of your calculations are going to be just what you want them to be. Okay, um, and we have more examples, I think, in the exercises of this. Well, so how is that defined? Product of two alphabets.
like this. And again, if x and y are just ordinary sets, okay, so not something like x minus y, so if, again, x is just something simple, countable, and y is just this, so again, just an ordinary set written additively, well, then PR xy, this is literally the, right, you just Cartesian product of sets. So then this just becomes the ordinary Cartesian product. Okay, in general, you can't really talk about that. So this is now offsets, okay, because I have assumed this. Well, then, of course, what are the letters of that? They are simply sorry, x in x, y in y, x, y. That's how you do Cartesian products, right? All just all of the pairwise products of your elements. But you know how what you do with the power sum. You just take each element and you raise it to the power r. So in that case, we just get this. And of course, you can just separate this. This is exactly the same as. So again, my definition is completely consistent with what you would get if you're just dealing with normal, normal sets of variables, okay? So, again, these things are, are good. All right. So, well, so we have addition, subtraction, multiplication. What about division? Well, I already indicated these things are really you can treat these alphabets as sort of elements of some commutative ring. So division in general is a problem. So first of all, perhaps, again, before I get to that, so note that if you, for example, compute, let's, and I'll leave this for you as homework, and again, in one of the exercises later this morning, you'll see things like this as well. It will turn out that if you, Sorry, x times z, I can't do my, okay? If you just apply the rules, so either you take this as the Cartesian product, well, I should no longer call it the Cartesian product, the product of x times y minus z, what would you get? PR of x times PR of y minus z, the PR of y minus z is PR of y minus PR of z, all of that you need to multiply by PR of x. Over here, you can first say, no, it's this, PR of this minus PR of that, according to the rule how you do the minus, and then you do the products, and of course you'll get the same thing. So as I said, again, you can just check that you can co compute with these things as if you're just dealing with an ordinary commutative ring. Okay? So let's just say check. But I already checked it for you. You could see that, that everything was fine. Okay, so. Okay, so finally, what about, about, Division. So, well, in generally, so in general, does not work. But, I mean, we do have. So there are elements in my commutative ring that have, if you wish, an inverse. So let's just traditionally just say they are units. And in that case, you can write this effectively as sort of as if you're doing division. Okay? So let's define that. And maybe I'll do that the board over here. Um, OK, 
Okay? So it's the final definition in this whole business. I'm going to give meaning to x that I'm going to write as 1 minus q divided by 1 minus q. But as I said, there's not really a good sense of division. So how is this defined? So essentially, you should see this as dividing by a two-letter alphabet, or well, not dividing by the difference of two one-letter alphabets. This ha only has the letter one. This only has the letter q. So that is actually a unit, as I'll sort of. So well, first let me give you the definition. Okay, that's how I define this, but let's, let's look a little bit more closely at what that is. That's nothing but okay, which of course is equal to Okay, again, just by my rules, if I take a PR of, again, these pluses are just, right, just, these are the elements of my set, and each of them I take to the rth power. That's what a power sum does. So I get precisely this here. But we know what we can do if we have a product of two power sums, that's just the products of the two individual al alphabets, So in other words, you should really think of this 1 over 1 minus q, right, as the inverse of the alphabet 1 minus q. Okay? So, so in other words, this effectively is the infinite alphabet consisting of 1, q, q squared, and so on as its letters. Okay? That's what this is telling us. So let's just say 1 over 1 minus q is really just okay. This is, of course, this looks like just like the geometric series, and it is. But forget, don't forget, we're dealing with alphabets here, right? So we are doing something slightly different. Or, in other words, we can, of course, also say that the alphabet 1 minus q, so the letter 1 minus the letter q times this alphabet is equal to 1, okay? So these two are units, and therefore we can, it's justified to use this notation here, okay? But in general, most elements, of course, in this ring here are not going to be units, and we can't, we can't give a sense of what division is. All right, so, well, um, so two remarks, and I still, so I, I need another probably 20 minutes. So first of all, the warts, because there are some, which, well, I mean, after a, a while, right, if you really get used to it, even warts can be pretty, but some people don't like it. So, okay, so, so some warnings. So let, okay, so let, I have some alphabet. And again, I'm just going to write it like this to indicate it has a single letter. I call it Z, okay? And X, it's just, it's just X, okay? <coughs> I'm not going to specify what it is. Then PR, Z of X, well, I just take this product, right? 
Even though this alphabet has only a single letter, I'm still just follow the rules. Okay, but if I have a single letter, I just raise it to the rth power. And so I have this. Okay, well, what's the problem? If I write something like this, we had that earlier, n copies of the same alphabet, that's this. So you have to be very, very careful. So more generally, for what I'll call or binomial variables, so this is a binomial variable. Let me just write psi here. We write PR of psi of x. So I just, this n here is an integer, but for example, e.g., I just, and I also want to give meaning to pi times x, all right? But pi is really a, it's not a letter in, a, in an alphabet. I call it something else. I call it the binomial variable. So I distinguish that, and I just, So you really have to tell the reader if something like this n here, is this some maybe a letter in an alphabet that I have perhaps not so cleverly written as n because it was running out of variables, or if it's actually, a, well here it's not. This is not a letter in an alphabet. This means n copies of this. This means psi copies of that, even when psi is maybe real or whatever. This is still perfectly consistent and, and okay. But you have to be very, very careful not to mix them up. A letter is a letter, and, and other things are other things. As I said, and I always talk, called them binomial variables when he was talking to me, and I, I don't know, but you have to be. And so in particular also, sorry? Oh, <laughs> did I write? Yes, <laughs> let's not. That, that's overstating, uh, yeah, absolutely, okay? And so in particular, indeed, also with an ordinary minus sign, because I already have, now if I want psi to be negative one, so that's sort of multiplying an alphabet with a binomial variable that is minus one is not the same as a platistic minus sign. Okay, that's a consequence of this. So, so we need two types of minus sign. All right. So, so in particular, uh, we need another minus sign. Namely, if, if I want to, my psi is that can, for example, be any real or any complex or whatever you want, what if I want it to be minus 1? How do I write that down? Well, we just write this. So if psi is minus 1, we write we write this as an epsilon. So in so an ordinary minus sign inside platistic brackets, we don't write it as minus, we write it as epsilon. Okay? So in other words, so i.e. PR. Well, let's do it. I can do both of them at once, for example. Hopefully you're, you're with me on this, right? This is a binomial variable. So I can just pull it out. 
right? This means I have taken this alphabet minus one times. And what that means is, well, okay, let's first just do it like this and then later. That is outside of it. So hold on. This is the normal world here. We already had a notation for a minus sign. And so it's just this. But if I write this, well, by definition, that, sorry, so here, of course, I should have raised this to the power r. Um, no, 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 I'm not doing that right. Let's see. Um, no, 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 that's, this one, I just pulled it out. Um, I need to, I need to be careful now. Now I'm messing up my, Oh, so this, I don't want this to be binomial, in fact. Okay, so no, I don't want this. Okay, so then it's fine. That one is not a problem. In that case, actually, there's no inconsistency. So, okay, so in this case, it's consistent. So that's right. So that's fine. So we'll get to, okay, so maybe I don't want to write it like that. You see, I already get myself confused here. But we do need another minus sign. Okay, so this would be fine. So actually, the binomial variable minus times one alphabet is the same as the negative. So I got myself. You see how dangerous this game is. But what I want, if I want this alphabet, so let's now write it down. So let's get it correctly. If I want this, how do I write that? That's really where I guess what Leo was getting at. So he tripped me up here. Okay. I have an alphabet where each variable is minus some other variable. Now, now I'm in real trouble. OK, so how do I write this? Well, this, so maybe I shouldn't say in particular, because the binomial variables with that minus sign was actually OK. This, I'll write like that. OK, so now I'm good. Sorry? This is still, I just say this x consists of that, but I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed to write this. Oh, i sorry, I write here. Ah, you're absolutely right. I, my notation is terribly inconsistent. So if I have this, okay, so that's just my normal x, and now I want to consider this. So the same alphabet, but every letter has been negated. And so to indicate that, finally we get there. So thanks. Yes, yes. Been talking for too much and can't think anymore. That is, now we're, we're good. OK? So that means you take the alphabet X and every letter. So this means negate. every letter of, of, of x. So I can do that, which is not the same as this. OK, so that thing, so I should say epsilon of x. So let, really, let's now get it right. Use additive notation is not the same as this, because that is, by definition, minus x, and that's a different thing, OK? Well, so now why is that different? We can really only check that. That's, of course, where I was getting it all wrong, by actually putting this inside a power sum and check what happens to see if these things are indeed different. Because if you just work with these alphabets, then, well, danger. So let's check. So PR, well, first of all, of minus x, we already said it was minus PR of x. But PR of epsilon of x, well, what happens? This is just, right, according to the definition of the power sum, if I just assume that this is additive, OK, so again, because that's how we 
right? We define it by first checking what happens in the additive case, and then we just extend this to any alphabet. So that's how we should do this. So here we take sum over all of the letters. Well, all of the letters in epsilon x, because that's my alphabet. But every letter in epsilon x was just minus an xi, right? So now we are in the outside world, no longer inside platistic brackets. That's this. The x here are in epsilon x. I, this just says that I take every letter of this alphabet and I just raise it to the rth power. Okay, so the letters of that alphabet are these things, if I, if I label them. Oh, well, okay, so let's just use, let's write it like this, so not to get confused, okay? So if X itself is, right, really a traditional alphabet, and I give them actual labels, okay? So I take each of the letters of this, that's minus xi, and I raise it to the power r. So it's good we do these warnings, because you can see, certainly if you do this in front of the board, this is minus 1 to the power r, and then just pr of the actual x itself. And that's not the same as this thing, right? Unless r is, right? Unless r is odd, so you have to be very careful, okay? So that's not the same. So that sort of makes this claim here, okay? Um, I want to very quickly, um, so I need two more, well, three more minutes just to make some remarks about, um, the elementaries and the complete symmetric functions and something, and how this relates to the uh, lambda as a self-dual co-commutative Hopf algebra, because that's one of the exercises you're going to do later. So give me another few minutes. Okay. So first of all, so remarks. I mean, I haven't really proven this, but you're going to prove that later this morning. So changing to, well, so changing an alphabet such as, well, let's say I take x, and maybe I decide to change it to this thing, or maybe I take an alphabet, and I map it to something like that. So this, of course, would be a map from lambda to lambda. This would be a map from lambda to lambda tensor lambda, and so on, and you can cook up any kind of substitution. Uh, okay, well, maybe changes of, of alphabets are known as as platistic substitutions okay and these are well ring homomorphisms okay so i haven't really checked that i've told you how it works on the pr you need to really check it on the basis and, and you'll be checking that this afternoon. So you are allowed to do that. So if you have some identity with a really simple alphabet, you can take that same identity 
hit it, replace your alphabet with something that's really, really complicated, and hopefully you get something that's highly non-trivial. Okay? And there's many examples where this, this works, where really all you need to do is compute with alphabets and nothing else. Okay? But you need to first convince yourself that making such a substitution is, is allowed. Okay, so that's the first remark. The second remark is, so let's number them. Okay, so as I said, you'll be, so this is exercise for you. And it's part of remark number two. Uh, so platistic substitutions relate to the structure of lambda as a well, the self-duality is not really, I mean, that is a property, but that's not necessarily what, so let's drop that. Uh, Co-commutative Hopf algebra and don't worry if you don't know what that is, because again, you'll do an exercise about this. But let's just very quickly run over a few of the things that we have. For example, there's a notion of co-multiplication that's one of the things that you have in Hopf algebra. Well, in fact, first of all, you have the structure of a bi-algebra, so we have a multiplication and a co-multiplication. And co-multiplication takes you from lambda to lambda tensor lambda. And for us, that's nothing. So platistically, that's just this. So you're done. OK, well, in particular, so you, OK. The multiplication, so co-multiplication, in fact, we I think we've chosen to write this as mu. It's also often written as a delta, but whatever. There's different notations out there, but let's not confuse the. There's a multiplication. Which I think we, in our exercise, have written as m for multiplication, where you go from, so as I said, we have a bar algebra, so you go in the other direction. And how does that work? Well, if I have some expression in, right, two alphabets, x and y, so that's why we're in the tensor here. All you're doing is just setting that, oops, second alphabet equal to the first. That's your multiplication. So on the level of alphabets, again, this is completely trivial. And, okay, I'm not going to give you all of the structure of, but one of the things that you have beyond just being a bi-algebra, that turns it into a Hopf algebra, is, again, for those who know that, it's called the antipode. Which takes you from lambda to lambda, and I think we use S for the antipode, and again, there's different notations out there. But what does it mean in terms of platistic stuff? It's just changing X to its negative, and you're done. So again, that's very easy at the level of alphabets. So if you sort of read a book about bi algebras or Hopf algebras, right, it's all very complicated and all these kind of rules, but on the, at the level of alphabets, it completely trivializes. Okay? Okay, the third remark, which I had actually planned to show you, but I'm running out of time and I really want to start 
on the sure function. So I'm going to give you a few identities that really show you that, so that's just to copy my list here. So for example, if I take my elementary symmetric function, it's really nothing but a complete symmetric function. So you really don't need both. Right? They're just one and the same object. Just evaluate it at a different, well, you just replace x to, by its negative, and then up to a sign, you get the other function. Okay? That was already reflected in some of the relations we saw earlier. Um, we had this involution on the ring of symmetric function. Remember, we sends e to an r. Well, you can read it off from this. This minus 1 to the power r really came from this, we still see it here, this epsilon. So that is nothing but just taking x and replacing it. OK, so again, at the level of alphabets, that's just in one stroke and you're done. You've carried out this involution on the ring of symmetric functions. Um, and as I said, all of these are, so it's trivial to prove. So for example, just to, and I know I should stop, to indicate how this works here, remember that we had something like that. OK? So what would happen, as I said, that's sort of the last sentence I'll write on the board. What would happen if you change x to its negative? So I said, oh, these are really simple exercises as well, right? That's all you're doing, right? I've just changed x to negative x, so still true. But at the level of the power sums, the power sum of the negative of an alphabet is just the negative of that power sum. OK? That essentially is all you need, all right? That will essentially imply, OK, because, well, if I again want to express this in terms of the sigma, OK, or if I take the log, for example, it just becomes 1 over the log. And so, and so effectively, remember that with, we had something like the so we had times the generating function that I never gave a name for the completes or for the elementaries. And we, right, we had this, and that was equal to 1. Okay, well, that's the same thing. If I take this thing and I multiply it by e to the power by sigma, I also get a 1. Okay, that's that same 1 that you see over here. Okay, so that's the same as saying that is equal to 1, okay? So it's very easy to go from one to the other and so on, okay? So in any case, as I said, there are useful exercises to do for yourself, right? Because that, okay, that tells me that this is really psi, well, up to a sign, okay? But this is essentially going to give you with on the, on the negative of that alphabet. All right, anyway, I, I should stop here. So as I said, just make this homework. But you see that working with these alphabets is really a unifying feature 
because now many symmetric functions that appeared at first to be the same, and there's this long list of definitions, that you can get one from the other, for example, just by changing your, your alphabet. That's much more convenient. So you can forget about the elementary symmetric functions now. So we only need complete, OK? And all right, and I, I, as I said, sorry for running a little bit over time, but uh, so at least I can start with the sure functions tomorrow. Thank you. Sorry? Yeah, okay, sure.